Most of us think we know what kind of people our neighbors are, but every town, no matter how small, has dark and violent secrets. It doesn't get much smaller than Ketty, a Northern California resort community surrounded by dense forests with a population of less than 100 people. In 1981, it became the setting for a gruesome quadruple homicide that is officially still classified as unsolved. But a closer look at the evidence reveals that the murderers may have gotten away with the crime due to a botched police investigation and possible cover-up. This is the true story of the massacre in Cabin 28. It's April 11, 1981, and 36-year-old Glenna Sue Sharp is spending the evening at home with her 12-year-old daughter Tina, her 10-year-old son Greg, and 5-year-old son Rick, as well as her 12-year-old friend Justin Smart. They're watching an episode of The Love Boat and generally having a quiet evening. They live in Cabin 28 in the small community of Ketty, located 7 miles north of Quincy, California in Plumas County. It was formerly a bustling resort, but by the early 1980s the resort had been largely abandoned and the cabins were being rented out by low-income families. The three-bedroom cabin is a welcome break for Sue, who had been thrown out of her former house by her abusive husband a year earlier, and had been living in a trailer before moving to Ketty. Her oldest daughter, Sheila, is spending the night at the neighbor's cabin, like she typically does on Saturday nights. Sue's oldest son, 15-year-old John, and his 17-year-old friend, Dana Wingate, are trying to hitchhike their way back to Ketty after spending the day in nearby Quincy. They are last spotted on the road between 9 and 10.15 p.m. Back in cabin 28, the young kids go to bed and Sue stays up watching TV. Sometime during the night, two intruders enter the home. They do so without force, either because Sue lets them in or because the door to the cabin is unlocked. The intruders bind Sue's hands and feet with appliance wire and gag her with a pair of her own panties. She is then stabbed repeatedly and also bludgeoned with a Daisy Powerline 880 rifle. It's unclear whether Johnny and Dana are home at this time or whether they walk in later, but either way, they are both bound with medical tape and wire. Dana is strangled to death by hand and bludgeoned. John is stabbed and also bludgeoned. The victims suffer blows from at least two hammers, a steak knife, and a butcher knife. The steak knife had been used with such force that the blade was bent at a 25 degree angle. For an unknown reason, the intruders leave the three small boys sleeping in the bedroom unharmed. Even more mysteriously, Tina is taken from the cabin. The next morning, Sheila Sharp returns to the cabin in order to fetch clothes for church when she walks in on the crime scene. Horrified, she runs back to her neighbor's cabin and alerts them. Sheila and the cabin's matriarch, Zonita Siebold, rush across the street to cabin 25, where the resort owner lives. Together they contact the Plumas County Sheriff's Office. Sheila, Zonita, and Zonita's eldest son Jamie return to cabin 28. They go around back and knock on the boy's bedroom window. To their surprise, the boys are completely unharmed. Jamie helps Greg, Rick, and Justin out of the window, and then goes up the back stairs. He finds the back door open, but the cabin is silent and empty, apart from the dead bodies. The police arrive and find bloody fingerprints on a bottom post of the stairwell leading to the back door, blood on the door handle of Sue's car, stab marks on the walls of the living room, and a large amount of blood splatter. The intruders had cut the phone cord in the girl's bedroom, but they hadn't taken anything from the cabin, ruling out the possibility that it was a robbery. Curiously, Sue's body is the only one covered with a blanket. In the garbage can of a nearby general store, police find bloody tissue, a red-handled pocket knife, a cardboard box with blood on it, and bloody toilet tissue twisted at the end. Three years after the murder, fragments of Tina's skull and bones are discovered by a bottle collector searching for antiques in a remote area called Camp 18 near Feather Falls, California. Suspicion quickly fell on two men, Martin Smart, who was a neighbor of Sue was living in Cabin 26 with his wife Marilyn, and Beau Bobaday, who Marty had met at a VA hospital where he was being treated for PTSD. 
Martin, Bo, and Marilyn were questioned after the murders and according to their statements, they had stopped by Cabin 28 on the day of the murders in order to invite Sue out for drinks. She declined their invitation so they went to the bar without her. At the bar, Marty became angry over the music that was being played and all three of them went back to their cabin. Marilyn claimed she went to bed shortly after. Marty said that he made a phone call to the bar to complain about the music once again and then headed back there with Bo. Marty was reportedly a friend of Plumas County Sheriff Doug Thomas and was rumored to have lived with him for a short time, although Thomas has denied both claims. There's rumors that the sheriff also told the two men to get out of town. Bo had lied to the police about being a former officer, which may have been part of the reason the police were so lenient when questioning him. In a bizarre twist, he attempted to shift the blame to Justin, but police never seriously believed that a 12-year-old could have committed the murders. Marty also made a strange, unprompted claim that he was missing a hammer with a blue handle. Years later, in 2016, a hammer matching that description was found by a man metal detecting near the site of the murders. The Department of Justice eventually gave the men polygraph tests that they seemingly passed. However, the nature of the tests and the reliability of the agents has also been called into question. The DOJ was also contacted years after the murders by Marty's therapist, who said that Marty had confessed to killing Sue and Tina because Sue had been encouraging Marilyn to leave him, but this was another thread that was left unexplored by the agents. After Tina's remains were discovered, but before they had been identified with dental records, the sheriff's dispatcher received an anonymous call. The tape was never admitted into evidence and was only recently discovered at the bottom of a box in an unopened envelope in the investigation's files. Just as recollection of the event has wavered throughout the years, it's believed that he had possibly witnessed the murders but had either blocked out the memory of the attacker's identity due to emotional trauma, or was being purposely misleading in fear that his stepfather would harm him. He gave descriptions of the suspects while under hypnosis and even gave a detailed account of the murders which he claimed to have seen in a dream. The final damning piece of evidence that was recently discovered was a letter written by Marty to Marilyn shortly after the crimes. It read, I've paid the price for your love and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? Marilyn claims not to remember reading the letter but has confirmed that the handwriting belongs to her husband who passed away in 2006. Bo Bo Bidet died in 1988. It seems as though the Ketty murders are closer than ever to being solved, and maybe one day soon there will be justice for Sue Sharp and her family. If you're interested in learning more about this case, I highly suggest visiting ketty28.com, where you'll find a lot more details and an in-depth discussion of the case. If you like this video, please subscribe to Cryptic for more.